you, Philippe. Now you know what the short pause between presentations sounds like. So um, I'd like to welcome the next speaker, uh, Manu Sporny. Uh, Manu is the founder and CEO of Digital Bazaar. And within W3C, he's the co-chair of the RDFA Working Group and chair of the new Web Payment, oh, sorry, RDFA Working Group and, co and chair of the Web Payments Community Group. Uh, and he'll be focused, I think, this morning on the community group's work in the area of Web Payments. Manu, thank you. All right, so um, just a bit of a heads up, there's going to be an audience participation uh, portion of this uh, slide deck, uh, probably towards uh, about the middle of it. So um, if you nod off during the uh, first part of the uh, slideshow, uh, you may be in for a rude awakening because there's going to be lots and lots of yelling, hopefully halfway through. Um, so. Um, this talk uh, is titled W3C Community Groups, but what it's really about is how to affect lasting global change in our world. Right? How do we take the technology that we use on an everyday basis and make a positive impact on the world with that technology? Right, just a little bit of background on, on what I do. Um, as Ian said, I'm the founder of a company called Digital Bazaar, uh, and the goal of our company, the dream of our company, is to make banking and finance radically open and transparent. Right? Transparent like the web. And the reason we care about this, uh, this goal, this dream, is, we, is that we want to help not only people in the first world countries, right? not only the industrialized nations, but we want to help the five billion people, uh, five billion people around the world that don't necessarily have access to wealth creation tools, things that we take for granted, things like a checking account, things like being able to save uh, for your family. Right? So we're very concerned about uh, changing the way we deal with money uh, in our society. We also care very deeply about building the web using open technologies. Right? We feel that open technologies are really the only way that you get a technology, a web technology, out to millions, if not billions, of people. Right? But how do you do that? Right? We, we talk about changing the world all the time, but we don't necessarily focus on the how. We don't tell people how you take the bits and bytes that we see uh, flowing across the web and you change society with that. So that's, that's what we're going to focus on uh, today. And there's a great quote by uh, Chuck Blanick. Uh, who basically says that the only lasting change that we can really create is changing the way people think. Right? So people think about technology as, as the bits and bytes. They think about it as HTML and HTTP. But without a goal, that technology is more or less useless to society. Right? So, the, so what we're trying to do is we're not trying to create new technologies. We're trying to change the way people think using technology. And as web technologists, we're in a fantastic position to do this, right? There are very little professions in the world where you can sit down at a computer, type out a couple of lines of something, and have it affect tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people's lives. Right? So we're in one of the best positions to enact this global change. But again, how do we do this? What's the process? So one of, the, one of the, the ways that we can do this is we can create a technology that is ubiquitous, right? So this is uh, Vince Cerf. He's a co-creator of TCP IP. TCP IP is used to transmit uh, all of the web pages and emails and, and messages that we send to each other on the web. Um, so the answer could be, well, 
the how is you just create something that everybody is going to end up using. But again, that's not really an answer. Here's another set of technologies that we use every single day. Uh, HTML, HTTP URLs, all right? Co-created by Tim Berners-Lee. But again, the how's not there. How do you get from the bits and bytes, from the technology, to something like this? This is the Arab Spring, right? Tahrir, Tahrir Square right after Mubarak resigned. Right? You can see fireworks going off. People are in the streets. Um, a lot of this movement was organized through Facebook, through Twitter, through email. Right? There was a fair bit of it that was also done through phone, and of course, face-to-face -face meetings, things like that. But the web was a part of this. Occupy Wall Street is another one of these movements. Right? It's a fairly fresh movement, and even more so, it spread very, very rapidly, very quickly, because of the web. Right? People are talking about Occupy Wall Street movements in blog posts, in emails, on Twitter, on Facebook. The web is, is helping people organize these movements and change society and change the world. Right? I don't mean, to, I don't mean to, to, to insinuate that the Arab Spring or Occupy Wall Street happened because of the web. They would have happened regardless. Right? But the web certainly accelerated the change made it happen much faster. Things that would have taken several years to organize now can be organized in a matter of uh, days, weeks, or months. Right? And ultimately, the web, the technology of the web, changed the way we organize ourselves. Right? It fundamentally changed the way we think about organizing ourselves on starting movements uh, to, to better society. But what's the spark? Right? How do you get from people thinking about technology to positive, global, societal change? I think the answer to that question is fairly straightforward. It's standards. But what an awful word, right? The term standard is misleading. It sounds boring. You can't really bring it up in a party or at a, at a party and have people think that you're talking about anything really interesting. But it is deeply interesting, isn't it? Standards are the way that we create social change in the world. They're deeply important social contracts. They are the culmination of what we believe our technology should do for society. And thus, they're vitally important in creating and operating uh, a, a blueprint for how society should operate. So what does this process look like, right? So we're talking about this thing that, that has this massive effect on society. What does the process look like? How, how is it created? Uh, how is the standard created? So typically what happens is you have someone that's working for a large organization, uh, and they come up with an idea, something that their organization needs to accomplish, and they approach the World Wide Web, Web Consortium or the Internet Engineering Task Force with the idea. Uh, and that group of companies decide whether or not they're going to back the work uh, and usually, if they decide to back the work, uh, a working group is created. Now, the W3C is really great about getting public input uh, into these working groups. So they work on these documents and, and um, refine them over time uh, with public input. Uh, there's a lot of arguing and politics involved, unfortunately. Uh, Any time that you have more than three people in a room, there's politics. Um, but usually, at the end of the process, you've got you know, two or three years, and out pops a standard, right? So typically, this is the way that, that standards work has, has been done. And this should look pretty familiar to you. It's the standard, uh, the, the standards making model is basically the sausage factory model, right? You have, a, you have a kind of an idea of what goes into the standard. You don't really know what goes, in, goes on inside the factory. But uh, what pops out is something that most people enjoy. Right. So there are problems with this sausage factory. One of them is that it's very corporation-centric versus public-centric. Right? If we're talking about things that are going to have a massive impact on society, we want to make sure that the public has a strong voice in the process. And like I said before, the W3C has been really great about getting public input uh, in on their standards. It's very difficult to get people to comment on, on how these technologies uh, should, be, should, should work for society. Right? 
but at its core, still, it's a corporate, someone at a corporation usually uh, pushing, pushing the idea. Not necessarily a, a bad thing either. Um, the, other th the other problem with this model is that it's incredibly difficult uh, for an uh, individual to introduce any kind of innovative work into the process. Right? It's difficult for uh, a single person to say, hey, I have this great idea. I think that we should work on it and have a bunch of corporations or companies pick up the idea and run with it. And the other, the other bad thing about it is that you actually don't want that to happen during standards work. You don't want innovation during standards work. You want to have a very clear idea of what you're standardizing before you go into the process. Otherwise, there's lots of arguing uh, involved and the standard doesn't make it out of the process uh, on time. And the last point here is that you know, I, I said that it's very corporation-centric versus public-centric. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Um, it, it's, it's sort of unfair to ask corporations. Corporations spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, um, working on these standards. And it's unfair to ask them to do something that's not necessarily in their best interests. Um, corporations, the corporations we have today, uh, are very focused on, uh, on creating a return for their investors. Um, and it, at times, their investors are not necessarily the public. So it's not necessarily good to ask corporations or fair to ask corporations to spend their money uh, to, to work on things in the, in the interest of the public good. So I think this is where the W3C community groups really help things, right? So remember I said that there are fees involved to, to start work at the, at the W3C? Um, well, W3C community groups have absolutely no fees. It's completely open to the public. Anyone can participate. This is a very, very big move away from the way things, things have been working in the past. It's, it's, it's a, a very positive step uh, in the right direction, I think, for uh, global society. They're very lightweight and easy to spin up. Traditionally, W3C working groups can take months to start up. Uh, sorry, W3C uh, working groups, traditional W3C working groups can, can take months to start up. W3C community groups can take a matter of hours, if not a few days, to start up. So they're, they don't cost anything. The public can, can join. They're very easy to set up. Um, and the other positive thing about W3C community groups is that there's no time limit. You have plenty of time to experiment, deploy, reiterate the design before you put it into the W3C process for standardization. And that's, what, what that does is that it increases the probability of your success. It increases the likelihood of the standard success because you have time to work on it, to tinker on it, until you're sure that this is what uh, is going to be good for society or, or, or good, for, good for what you're uh, trying to accomplish uh, on the web. So this, this, this graphic basically shows you what the typical W3C process looks like versus the community group process. And it, it, the, the typical W3C process is at the top. Usually what happens during standardization work is you know, you've got a company or a bunch of people that want to create a standard. You create a bunch of working drafts, which is basically people writing down how the standard should work. Um, once you're done, you tell the public, hey, I think we're done. That's called the last call. Uh, and if you're lucky, you'll have only one last call. Uh, but typically, you'll have many last calls, so several last calls, because uh, usually the, the public is very good at picking out uh, problems with the specification. That requires you to go back through the process. And then you go to the candidate recommendation phase, which is uh, basically where you say, hey, we need implementations. We need two interoperable implementations for a, a web standard. Um, once you have those two implementations, you go to proposed rec, which is basically saying, OK, that's it. We're pretty sure we're done. Right? And then out pops the standard. Right? That's the official, official specification uh, from W3C. Now, the community group work is meant to replace a lot of the uncertainty in this process. You, you put the community group process first, you figure out what you're doing, and then you put it into the W3C process. So when you get it into the W3C process, it's a more regular, it's a, you, you understand uh, what the time frame is to getting the, the, getting the standard out. Um, the other really positive thing about this W3C community group process is that it can start from a public initiative. Right? It doesn't have to be a company starting it. Companies can start community groups if they want to, but the public can start their own community groups as well. So, so what are some of the benefits that you get uh, with joining the W3C community group? 
Um, there's a mailing list that you get. Every single uh, community group get their, gets their own mailing list. You get a uh, wiki. You get an issue tracker. Uh, you get a blog. These are all the tools that the regular standards uh, makers today use. Right? The other thing that you get from this is you get archival forever. Right? For, for as long as the W3C exists, those mailing lists, those wikis, those issue trackers, uh, those blogs uh, are, are going to exist. And the great thing about that is that in 20 years, if you create a world-changing technology, in 20 years you can go back and see how it was created. Just like today, you can go 20 years back in time and see how the first version of HTTP and the first version of HTML or CSS was created. Right? That has huge uh, positive implications for uh, society. Right? And the number one thing, I think, with the, with the W3C community groups, the benefit that you get is you attract people that are smarter than you. I know there, there are tons of incredibly smart people in this room right now, but what we have found by taking part in these groups is that you get a ton of other really amazing, talented people. These people kind of flock to W3C because that's where all the really cool technology uh, is being created uh, these days. And it's amazing to, to see somebody come into a group, find something that you hadn't thought about at all, propose a change, and get it into the, into, into the specification. Right? So attracting people that are smarter than you is vitally important if the, if the technology that you're creating is going to have a positive impact uh, on the world. OK, so let's uh, shift gears a little bit. This is uh, the uh, audience participation phase. It's coming up just in, in a little bit. I love this guy. Um, this guy is uh, at the Occupy Wall Street uh, event um, in, in New York City. Right? And the, the, the thing that I think, that Occupy Wall Street means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. There's no one, one thing that it means. right? But I think one of the things that uh, they're concerned about is the use of wealth in society. Right? Is wealth benefiting society as a whole, or is it starting, or are we starting to see uh, problems with the way that we've built our banking and financial structure? And this is, this is the web payments community group work that we're doing. Right? So I'd like to take a little bit of time and talk about the problems with money in society today. Right? I think the number one problem with the way that we deal with finance in the world is that we do all of it behind closed doors. The protocol is closed. The network is closed. Right? Look, at, look at the way that the web's built. The protocol for the web is HTTP. There's an open specification for it. If you, t if you ask someone, how does a document get from one place to the other in, on the web, they can point you to a document. You can look at it. If you, if you know how to program, you can implement it, and you're on the network. That's an incredibly powerful thing. Being able to look at a document, implement something, and then be, become part of the network is incredibly powerful. And that's something that we absolutely do not have anywhere in the world today in our financial systems. Right? The network's also closed. Nobody, everybody in this room could, say, could go to an ISP, set up a web server, and be on the web. Right? But no one in this room can become part of the financial network. You always have to go through a proxy. That's not to say that banks and, and, and finance and, and, and everyone that's involved in the financial industry is bad and terrible. Absolutely not. There are a bunch of really great people working there. But the, but the underlying system, the design, is flawed. All right? The entire system is centralized, slow, and inefficient. To give you an example of, of uh, what this looks like in practice, if you wanted to send an email to anyone in this room, right? if you meet someone at this conference and you want to send an email to them, you ask them for their email address. You type it into your email client, and then you hit send. Right? It's easy. 40 milliseconds later, they have the email. If you want to send money to anyone in this room, you meet them at the conference, you don't have a choice, really, of what you, what, what, what you give them. You could give them your credit card number. That's a bad idea. You could give them your banking account number. That's an even worse idea. Right? And of course, you can use things like PayPal and, and, and uh, all, all these other uh, online services. But there's no open protocol to doing that. Right? 
to give you an, to, so, so the example with, the, with transferring money is ACH. If you want to send $5 to someone else, typically the way you do it is an automated check clearinghouse payment. And these payments can take up to 60 days to clear from one account to another. Right? That's the state of the art right now. So we need to change that. There's also very little transparency in these systems. Uh, very few people know what happens to their money once they put it in the, into a checking account. It's, what your money does after you deposit it is very much a mystery to, to many people. Uh, in some cases, that, that money uh, magics, it's, magics itself into $30. So if you put $1 in, uh, the bank can then create $30 in loans on that $1 that you put in there and, and uh, leverage that uh, to, to give loans out to people. It would be nice if we could actually participate in that, right? It would be nice if we could loan money out to people in a, in a way that uh, helps them uh, and, and helps us. So I think the underlying, the, the underlying point that I'm getting to is that the current system is not very equitable, right? It's not a fair system. It's not set up like the web. And we want that. So um, there's a really interesting thing at the Occupy Wall Street movements, and this is what I need everyone's help in the room for. Um, they're called mic checks. It's called the human microphone. And one of the, one of the really neat things that, that happens at Occupy Wall Street's movements, at these things called general assemblies, is that instead of using a powered device, instead of using a megaphone to get their message out, they just yell. Right? It's a very organic way of, of getting the message out. So typically what happens is you've got one person that's, that's, that wants to, uh, would like to speak, would like to propose something, and then the rest of the group just echoes that, right? so everyone can hear the proposal. So I'm going to propose what we do about this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yell mic check three times. They're going to shut my mic off. So the only way that the entire room is going to hear is if you guys participate. They're going to shut my mic off. I'm going to yell mic check three times, and then I'm going to start saying three short words at a time. And if you could, please repeat, uh, repeat those words. Yell into the air, not into the, your neighbor's ear. All right, can we cut my mic? Reception here tonight. Yeah, just around the corner. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, to all the world's people, I think that's very important, right? We don't just care. We we care about the industrialized nations of the world, but I think we should also care about the five billion people that don't necessarily have access to these types uh, of tools, these types of financial tools. So. Uh, we launched something called the Web Payments Community Group at the W3C. We created a standard called the PaySwarm standard. It's a very simple web standard uh, for transferring money, buying and selling digital content, and crowdfunding projects. Think of it kind of like an, 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 open, uh, uh, an open Kickstarter or an open uh, PayPal or Google Payments or Amazon, Amazon Payments, right? The fundamental difference here is that all of the designs and specs are open. All of our meetings are public. Anyone in this room can join the meeting and tell us what they think and how they think that the spec should change. Um, we have public teleconferences. Anyone's invited to join those. We record them. All the audio's out on the web already. Right? And so what, we hope, what I hope that you're getting a picture here, picture here of is that we're trying to be as transparent as possible in, in creating this global financial uh, protocol. The system's decentralized by design. We don't want any gatekeepers. 
you, the, the second that you, you uh, cordon off a group of people and say, you're responsible for innovation, and everyone else is going to follow you, I think that's when we start to fail right, as a society. We focus on speed. It should take 60 milliseconds for you to be able to support the person that you want, not 60 days. We care about data portability. If every single one of your transactions, all of your money, everything about your financial history can be taken from who you're banking with today to someone else the next day, I think you're going to be treated much more fairly as a customer. Right? And ultimately, what we're trying to do is create this fair and equitable system for society, an open, transparent system uh, for, for doing these types of uh, payments. Um, so how long did it take us to start the community group up? The startup time frame was actually pretty quick. Um, we identified the core of what we were trying to do. Right? This actually took us six years to do. Right? This took a long time to figure out exactly what you were going to do, what you're going to do to, to try and affect positive change. But once we had it, once we knew what we were going to do, starting the community group happened uh, within a week. Right? We created a W3C community group account. Anyone can sign up for one. It's free. Um, we proposed the group. You don't have to talk to anyone to do that. You just kind of type in a one paragraph description of what you want to do. Uh, in, in the, uh, in, on the W3C community group site. And then within five days, we had 20 people, right? And we started work. Now, 20 people might not sound like a lot, but if you, if you look at a lot of the W3C community groups, they have, you know, like five, six, ten people working on these world standards, right? So the, 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 the amount of people that actually take part in standards making is not as much as you would, you would like it to be, right? We want the public to be involved. It's just very difficult to get them involved. And I think that W3C community groups is going to change that in a very big way. Right. So what's the current standard? We ha actually have a working implementation of this PaySwarm specification. There's a demo site there that you could go to and check it out. Um, all of the specs are, are open. There's a REST-based API. It's built on the web. Um, and we're also working with a variety of other W3C working groups. Right? This, is, this is one of the great things. This is, this is you, you get really smart people uh, into your group by just participating, right? So we're working with the RDFA working group. We've actually launched a couple of other initiatives because we found that the technology that we needed didn't necessarily exist. So we're off, uh, there are several other people that are off kind of creating those technologies in parallel, right? And one of the, one of the most important things, I think, is that we have a clear purpose. We know what we want to accomplish, and we have an engaged community, right? You don't change the world in a positive way without having an engaged community, and W3C community groups allow you to do that. Right? It, it, so there are a variety of other uh, W3. Let's say that web payments isn't your thing. Let's say that you think that everything I've said on stage today is complete crap. Um, there are other W3C community groups that are really interesting uh, as well, right? So there's this uh, group called the Do Not Track Community Group. They believe that you should be able to tell websites whether, you're not, whether or not you want to be tracked or not. And they want to give you technology to, to, to empower you uh, to say whether or not you, you want to be uh, uh, tracked. It's a community group. The Games Community Group. Right, very, very interested in HTML5 and, and Canvas and WebGL and audio. They want to create a first-class gaming environment in the browser. Um, there's the oil, gas, and chemicals business group. Right? So there's, there's another uh, tier of groups called the business groups that are kind of like community groups. And these guys are focused on exchanging data on where the world supply of energy is um, so they can kind of keep society uh, operating. There's a web education community group. And the web education community group cares about uh, developer outreach, teaching people how to use standards, uh, basically helping people build the web in the right way, right? May being open about it. Um, there are 30, when I made this slide, there were only 30 plus groups. Now there are 40 plus groups, right? This was only a couple of days ago. So in the past two months, or since, since community groups launched, there are now 40 plus groups in operation. That's huge. I think that's, that's a success in, in, in and of itself. And, and I hope that they continue to grow uh, over the uh, next uh, couple of years. I think it's a great uh, public resource. Right? So ultimately, what I'm trying to, to get at here is that you now have a very powerful voice 
at the W3C and you have absolutely nobody standing in your way, if you have a great idea for a technology or if you have a part of the web that you don't feel is working uh, in the way that you want it to, in the, in the right way, right? take that great idea, find five people and start a community group right? and help make the web a better place uh, for everybody. So, I wanted to leave a, a decent bit of time for, for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts on any of this stuff, the W3C community group stuff, uh, please walk up to the microphone uh, and ask. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I talk about this stuff quite a bit. Uh, the link to the W3C community groups uh, is, is uh, down there at the bottom, w3.org uh, slash community. Uh, and the link to the Payswarm group, the way we're doing the web payments work, uh, is down there at the uh, bottom of the page. Um, so with that, are there any uh, questions, comments, or, or thoughts on any of this stuff? Got someone down there. Uh, Charles McCarthy Neville. I work at Opera and do W3C stuff. Since you took the topic a, a fair way out already, I was going to ask a question about distributed payment and taxation systems. All right. Um, right now, a lot of the places which don't really have electronic payment don't have checking, no one has checking accounts outside the US, it's backward and crazy. Um, but, but a lot of the places that don't have that also don't have the kind of uh, personal tax system which we have. Mm -hmm. And when you bring in distributed payments, your know, governments might start to look at the, all this money going past and saying, wait a minute, if it goes past electronically, then we can dip our little paws in that. Right. The, how does that fit into the pay swarm model? So, so the web payments group is interested in payments of all kinds, right? So there, there are a couple of really neat things happening in the world right now. One of them is called uh, Bitcoin. This is a cryptocurrency. It's the world's uh, first successful cryptocurrency. And it is decentralized, as decentralized as you can make uh, cryptocurrencies, right? So the idea behind this is that it's not government backed at all. It's just a bunch of people got together and they said, hey, we think, we think that uh, bitcoins are worth something, right? Which is how all, va all money gets its value. They say, we think that this is, this is worth something and people are actually buying and selling things. People are buying socks, uh, they're buying, uh, uh, you know, time, uh, work time on, on, on farms, they're buying illicit drugs with it. There, there are all kinds of things that, that you use uh, bitcoins for. And that's the one thing that governments are really scared about, is that they can't necessarily tax it easily. Right? And it's, it, it's an open question. I, don't have, I do not have an answer for that. I don't know what governments are going to do. Some governments have already banned it. Other governments are thinking about banning it. Um, but what we're going after is not this fully, uh, this, this anti-government stance on, on any of this stuff. We want to change the existing systems to be more equitable. We don't want to disrupt absolutely everything and, and uh, potentially create uh, chaos and havoc as a result of it. So we have to be very careful and measured about the technology that we create. Remember, we're trying to create technologies that are supposed to support, to, supposed to support society. And if we accidentally harm governments, which are supposed to be representatives of people, we end up harming the people themselves, right? So we have to think about tax systems. We have to think about how this works within uh, the, the legal, legal frameworks. Does that uh, help? Does it answer your question? We could talk all day. So yeah, that's an interesting answer. Thanks. OK, great. And I'm very, very interested in talking about this uh, with, with anyone else. If you, if you see me at the conference, I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, any other uh, questions? about community groups or web payments in general? All right, great. Thank you very much.